Good evening and welcome. Tonight on the show, we have a few members of the Fiji Cancer Society. Our first guest is Mrs. Belinda Chen, the CEO of the Fiji Cancer Society. Thank you for joining us this evening. And our second guest, Dr. Iletia Ndelasau. He's a general surgeon at the CWM Hospital. Thank you for joining us. According to the Union for International Cancer Control, or UICC, around the world, approximately 9.6 million people died from cancer in 2018. And more than half of cancer deaths are happening in the least developed parts of the world. To celebrate 20 years of advocacy against cancer and raising awareness, the UICC undertook an international public opinion survey on cancer, the findings of which were revealed in uh, February early, earlier this year. Um, we'd like to talk about some of the things that were revealed in that survey. Um, for example, on a, global, on a global level, over three in five people surveyed, that's approximately 61%, say that they have been affected by cancer in some way. If not directly, then they know of someone or they're related to someone who has suffered from cancer. Globally, almost three in five people surveyed, uh, approximately 58% say that they're concerned about, the develop, uh, about developing cancer in the future. And most people, approximately 87%, say that they're aware of at least one of the main cancer risk factors. Mm -hmm. But does awareness always translate into action? And that's what we'd like to discuss um, at the beginning of the show. Firstly, uh, to Ms. Mrs. Chan, could you discuss some of the local statistics around cancer that the Fiji Cancer Society has? Okay, um, I'm just going to refer to the statistics that we've collated from January to June this year. So we're looking at 170 newly diagnosed patients who have registered with us. So basically the stats I'm giving you is what we've collected ourselves and it's got nothing to do with the ministry. Mm -hmm. So 170 newly registered patients as opposed to 2019, we had uh, 224, which, you know, that's, th that's the whole year. We're not even... We're just halfway, and we've surpassed that t half of that two, 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 four. And those are of obviously concerning statistics. Yes, definitely concerning. Hmm. If we were to look in the past five years, would you say that there's a trend of cases rising each year? Yes, definitely. There is an increase, um, and in most cases, these increases are attributed to those that present late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're still fighting with them to get them to come in earlier, mm -hmm. but they're still coming late. So one of the, one of the main you know, things that the survey points out, uh, points out is that, I mean, awareness has been going on for a long mm -hmm. time now, right? Mm -hmm. The Fiji Cancer Society does so much work. There are so many organizations that are really on board with this advocacy. But has that awareness translated into action? I mean, because if it had, then, you know, people would be presenting earlier. We'd have, uh, uh, you know, noticed a change in mindset. So mm -hmm. if, if we can, talk about that for a while, whether awareness has translated into action, especially in our context in Fiji. I'd say half and half. Mm -hmm. um, we do have women, especially those who think that they have a lump, who are calling in earlier. Uh, but at the same time, we're also having women who are calling in later. Mm -hmm. um, so we, our awareness programs have been effective to the sense that people are starting to come in, um, which is the first step. But now it's making sure that they come in a little bit earlier mm. yeah don't leave it too long <coughs> come in as soon as you no notice that there there is a lump but besides that there's also um, the stigma associated with it um, people think that it's a curse you know from from yesteryear so we need to try and demystify we need to start talking about it openly um, we still look at it as something taboo, mm. but if we start talking about it a bit more openly over that kappa, over that gl glass of beer or that kava bowl, mm. it'll make a difference. Mm. And, and encourage each other to go get, get yourself checked, mm. you know, for ladies, mm. monthly mm. checks would mm. be good. Um, Mr. De La Salle, same question, mm. Dr. De La Salle. Yes. Um, does awareness translate into action? It's, um, that's a very important question. Uh, for me, uh, personally, I'm, I've only been in Fiji for a year. Uh, I did my training in New Zealand, uh, my surgical training, and I joined the surgical department here in June last year. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an eye-opening for me, personally. I've never seen uh, cases as bad as uh, we have in Fiji. So my first clinics here in Fiji, I could... Um, see very, very advanced uh, breast cancers. Uh, and it's young women, 
to older women, mm -hmm. educated women, you know, and women from villages who are not educated. So everyone is affected by, by cancers. Bowel cancer. Um, so I look after in the hospital with my other colleagues. We, we deal with breast cancers, thyroid cancers, and intestine cancers. Mm -hmm. uh, my other colleagues look after the urology part, the kidneys and the bladder. Uh, one of my other uh, surgical colleagues look after the soft tissues, so soft tissue cancers. So we see a lot of late presentations in Fiji. Mm -hmm. My experience so far is just uh, we are filled with so many people coming in late. Mm -hmm. And I ask the questions myself, why are we coming in late? Eh? Why, what are the factors that are stopping people to come in early to the hospital? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of factors. And I, I grew up in Fiji. I brought up in a village in, in Naitasiri. And we, one big factor that I believe is stopping people to come early is that this inbuilt belief of traditional healers. Mm -hmm. We have doctors in the village. We have uh, uncles and aunties who have hands that they, they, are, you know, they are blessed with these hands for certain conditions. And being a doctor, I, I work on evidence-based medicine, evidence-based medicines. Eh? Mm -hmm. I can't be telling patients, go and get massage mm -hmm. with cancers. Eh? Cancer is treatable and can be cured if patients present at an early stage. Stage one cancer means it's cancer still within that organ where it originate. Stage four cancers, it has gone out into other organs, and there's no cure for that. Mm -hmm. There's no drug, there's no surgery that can cure stage four cancer. Mm -hmm. a stage one cancer can be cured. Mm -hmm. And as a surgeon, I could confidently say we can cure cancer if we pick it up early. Dr. Ndelasa, if we were to just expound upon what you just said, mm -hmm. looking at demystifying, as Ms. Chan had alluded to uh, some time ago, about why people feel like whenever they're being diagnosed with cancer, they feel like it's a death sentence, mm -hmm. and that means sure. that they absolutely should not do anything about it. That's mm -hmm. the end of the road. They don't want to go for it. And sometimes they do de get diagnosed in the early stages, but like you said, they mm -hmm. rely on traditional medicine yes. or traditional healers. Uh, there's also this misconception that Cancer only is visible to them, mm. as in something that's not visible, it doesn't really count as something that they would look into. Mm. Do you think yes. that this is persistent in, in society in Fiji? Definitely, for sure, yeah, for sure. Can I just start off with that, to, to define cancer in simple terms? Uh, a cancer is a, a, a originate from a cell. Yeah? So our bodies, all parts of our body, start from a single cell, yeah? and this cell continue to divide to form an organ, we, which we are pre pretty much an organ. Eh? So each part of our body has got cells, and that cells divide. And there's tissues in our body that are called the, the, the control center. They control this cell division. And there's one cell that escapes mm -hmm. this control, and it continues to divide in an uncontrollable manner. And the causes of that cell to continue to divide in an uncontrollable man manner are multiple factors, yeah? and we could say there are risk factors that causes that, and that could be modifiable, and the factors that are non-modifiable. So non-modifiable factors are what we are born with. These are the so-called genetics. So it's in your blood. Uh, those you can't change. Yeah? So you can live a very healthy, normal life, but if you have a risk factor that's associated with your genes, you can't change that. Yeah, and the, the important thing to, to, to understand there, so if your family member have had cancer, any kind of cancer, that increases your risk compared to the normal population. Yeah, that's non-modifiable risk factor. Mm -hmm. The modifiable risk factors are lifestyle. A lot of it is lifestyle. And uh, I would just say everything we do is a risk. Walking out there in the sun, yeah, sunlight, too much sunlight, risk of skin cancer. Eating too much Oily, fatty food is a risk. Too much alcohol is a risk. Too much smoking is a risk. So too much of everything is a risk for cancer. So modifying those things could reduce the risk of you developing cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's important to really understand that. And then all these factors contribute to the cell to continue to divide. Mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. And th the way to pick them up is really, really difficult. Yeah? There's no single blood test in the world mm -hmm. 
no single scan to diagnose you with cancer, to say you've got cancer. Yeah. Uh, anybody could have cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, does, uh, there's no age, there's no religion that's, that stops you from getting cancer. Mm -hmm. But the key message that people need to be aware is to be body aware. Know what's normal for you, for your body, and if something is changed from the normal, that could be a sign of cancer. Um, before we move on to um, discussing risk factors, because I'd, I'd certainly like to follow up on, on some of the mm -hmm. things that you said, Doctor. Um, we were discussing perceptions, and, and, and Ms. Chan, in the work that, in, in the years that you've been working at um, um, the Fiji Cancer Society, um, could you talk to us about anything that you've noticed in terms of perception? Has there been a general change? I think I think there is a gen there is some change, but it's not enough change. Mm. Um, people still, at the end of the day, after a cancer diagnosis, they still resort to that traditional healing, because my aunt from the village said somebody they know has been able to cure someone mm. with cancer. So my aunt would come and put pressure on me, and get me to go and do that. So um, people are. Y you know, you're, you're running around trying to look for a, an instant treatment, whereas, you know, for us, w when they do come back and tell us that they're diagnosed with cancer, we encourage them to that extent where we make sure that transport is at their door to pick them up to bring them to the hospital. Hmm. And in most cases, the transport goes and the patient doesn't turn up. Um, so we're still fighting that battle with those who opt for traditional healing. So now we've just resorted to telling them, okay, you want to do the traditional healing, go ahead, but please come. Mm -hmm. Come to the doctors for your treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing wrong with it, but you mm -hmm. can also get the Western treatment right. because mm -hmm. like what Dr. Delisaro referred to, it's evidence-based. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's no evidence mm -hmm. or research done on traditional healing traditional medicine. Healing, yeah. So let them continue with that because it more or less gives them peace of mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But mm -hmm. you need to come to the doctor. So we don't discourage them. That's the only way we can do it. We need to meet them halfway. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, we lose them. Mm -hmm. We get them back when it's too late. Mm -hmm. And then they, um, they get really frustrated mm -hmm. and annoyed with the doctors. <coughs> we'll be back after a short break. Stay with us. Dr. Delasau, just carrying on from your comment on some of the risk factors. So if we go back to the survey across, uh, across the world, people that um, were surveyed appear to identify some of the most common risk factors. 63% correctly identified tobacco use, 54% harmful UV rays, and 50% tobacco smoke from others. However, some of the least recognized risk factors, according to the survey, 28% of people lack of exercise, 28% uh, of people, viruses or bacteria, and being overweight, 29% of people identified those as risk factors. Um, if we bring that to a local context, what are some of our risk factors here, some of the sure. um, risk factors that are associated with our lifestyles, especially in the Pacific? Sure. I believe in Fiji, the, one of the biggest risk factor that we don't realize is um, weight. Yeah. Weight is a big thing and uh, our lifestyle in Fiji is changing a lot. Mm -hmm. Back in the days, uh, I think our forefathers used to just walk everywhere, they eat healthy, um, they don't sit down a lot. Eh? Whereas for us nowadays, our, our work and our lifestyle is changed. I think our, one of the biggest risk factors is our weight. So obesity by itself is a big risk factor and it's been shown on studies that reducing your weight, yeah, reducing your weight by half, it's half your risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the good thing about losing weight, you reduce your NCDs as well. Eh? Mm -hmm. Diabetes, hypertension, stroke, cardiac reduces that as well. And that's, you know, it's just, you, you don't need uh, to be an astronaut to understand that, that is losing weight is good. Yeah? Um, smoking, we all know it's associated, it's a risk of all kinds of cancer. As a surgeon, it's something that, uh, that I don't like. Yeah? I don't uh, like seeing patients who smoke. 
I don't want to operate on patients who smoke. And basically because it it's affects the surgery, it affects your recovery, it's, it's, uh, it affects everything. Yeah. Healing, uh, you're slow to, to heal. Uh, I, I always encourage patients to give up smoking before I operate on them. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a, it's a balance. Yeah? Uh, I, I can only ask. Uh, alcohol is a risk uh, by itself. Eh? Uh, fatty food, uh, too much red meat, mm -hmm. all those are risk factors have been shown to be associated with colorectal cancer, too much red meat. And again, we are becoming more meat uh, eating and less vegetables and, and uh, fruits. Mm -hmm. So diet is a big thing. So healthy diet, exercising and losing weight would reduce a lot of cancers in general. Mm -hmm. In women, uh, can I just add, um, too much fat. Eh? So if you are overweight as a woman, it increases your risk of breast cancer and increases your risk of cervical, endometrial and ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. eh? Just being obese. So losing weight in, in Fijian, our culture, women tend to put on weight easily. Eh? Once you have a child or two, it's sort of normal to see women as being overweight. Eh? That's need to change. Mm -hmm. We need to, to change our mentality that we need to lose weight. As a country, we are becoming more obese. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we... Uh, the states is the is the biggest, but in Fiji we are getting there because of diet mm -hmm. and lack of exercise. So, if you were to tell us about the number of cases that you are presented with in mm. a year, mm. what would top the types of cancer that you are presented with? Uh, breast is up there, mm -hmm. definitely. Breast cancer. Uh, I as a, I'm a general surgeon, but I, I, in Fiji we have to do everything. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I sort of my interest is in the gastrointestinal area. Mm -hmm. Uh, stomach, the liver, gallbladder, and the large intestine cancer. But breast is being a biggest part of uh, my practice now since being here. We see a lot of breast cancers. And this is both male and female breast cancers? Uh, mainly females. 1% mm -hmm. uh, of breast cancers are f affects males. Mm -hmm. yeah, they present late as well. So I guess for males, it's really important to be aware of our breast. Mm -hmm. And again, we see the male cancers again with obesity. Mm -hmm. Obesity does come in with male breast cancers. If we were to look at uh, preventative measures, of course, uh, early uh, presentation is always something that you look for. Uh, mm. People need to come in for screening, they need to come up for checkups. But do you think that uh, with the general population that visits most of the health centers yes. and those of the medical profession, mm. do they ask for checkups for those sorts of cancers, for lumps, for any yes. sort of screenings? I, I would be really encouraging the, the medical officers and the health centers yeah, to be more proactive on this. As a country, Fiji and the Pacific, we are not very forthcoming. Mm -hmm. uh, we keep things to ourselves. We don't want to bother people mm -hmm. in general. Eh? Females, uh, moms, yeah, they, the, the health of the family is more important than their health. Mm -hmm. So I think for medical officers and doctors, we have a role to play. Mm -hmm. And the health centers, you need to be asking, have you noticed any lump? Uh, have you noticed any changes in your bowel habit? Have you noticed any bleeding that's not normal? Because cancer is not painful. Yeah? Cancer in general is not painful. A lot of women coming in saying, I've had this lump for three or four years. I haven't worried about it because it's not painful. Mm. But that's the real important thing. Cancer is not painful. Breast cancer present with a painless lump. Bowel cancer present with painless PR bleeding or rectal bleeding could be just an alteration in your normal bowel habit, mm. uh, mucus discharge, abnormal um, menstrual bleeding in women. Yeah? So if, you're, if your period changes for a reason, yeah? for no reason, mm -hmm. you, you, tend, you, you bleed for a week but suddenly you stop bleeding or suddenly you're passing big clots, these are signs of, of cancer. Yeah? They mm. could be cancer, put it that way. Yeah? But most of the time if you present, they find that it's something is actually not cancerous. Mm but you can be treated early uh, if you present early. I'd like to ask you, um, and, and this is to either of you, something that I hear a lot about and something like a perception that people in Fiji have, um, that a lot of perfectly healthy people mm. still get cancer. Mm. Uh, for example, the, the, if, if we take smoking, for example, mm. a lot of people that have been smoking from their teenage years until they're old never develop cancer. Mm. Someone can 
do everything right. They can exercise every day. They can eat the healthiest of foods. They can mm. refrain from alcohol or kava or cigarettes, mm. and that they can still develop cancer. So, so can you explain that to me? It's, it's a, the, one of those non-modifiable risk factors is uh, genetics. Yeah? Mm. So genetic is something we are born with. It's passed from your mom and dad. Yeah? It's, it's, in your, it's in your blood. Those you can't change. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, if you, your mom or dad or a relative has had a cancer, you are at risk. Mm. I think the key message for people to be aware, again, is to be body aware. Mm. If you're one of your parents has, has had bowel cancer or has had lung cancer, then you have to be more aware of any changes in that part of your body or any other uh, parts of your body. Yeah, that's the non-modifiable risk factors. Mm. And I guess changing your lifestyle yeah, reduces your risk as well. And I, I keep saying that uh, losing weight and uh, eating less fatty food, yeah, mm. rich fatty food and processed food is, is, a risk, is a risk on its own that increases your, mm. your risk of uh, developing cancer. Stay with us. We'll be back after a short break. Question um, to you, Mrs. Chen. Um, the UICC survey identified individuals that were living in high-income household who seemed more likely to recognize cancer risk factors than those living in low-income households. Um, this also held true when comparing people who have completed a university education to people who have not. So I, I, I just wanted to know from your own experience, maybe if you don't even have uh, uh, like you know solid statistics but just from your own personal experience do you think that this is true do you think that inequality also affects your chances of uh, you know being more aware about cancer and your likeliness of presenting early to a doctor um, yeah inequality does play a big role but then at the same time um, mm. you have people who are very well educated mm. um, they also are a bit naive as well um, however, most of the patients or the people that we support are from the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. Mm. So these are the people that um, tend to run to the traditional healers for mm. medication because they don't have the funds or the means to do it. So the thing is, the treatment offered at the divisional hospitals for, for those diagnosed with cancer are basically free of charge. Mm. Um, our services kick in once you're a confirmed cancer case and then we're able to support. So we provide transportation. If you're unable to take yourself to the hospital, we're able to provide transport. So irregardless of where you are in Fiji, the transportation service is available. We also, with uh, the Ministry of Health, who have a, the oncology unit has a palliative nurse that does home visitation, so we're able to provide transportation for the nurse, as well as medical supplies or supplies like diapers, um, medication, if there's a prescription that's been given. So whatever extra support or the humanitarian side of things, that's where the Fiji Cancer Society comes in. Um, we don't charge for the services. Everything is done free of charge. So that basically is provided for as long as there's a registration done there. Eh? So you just need to send someone in your family to come to the office and get yourself registered, and then we're able to provide the support we need. Mm -hmm. However, all these services are done, are only provided through the goodwill and support of the people of Fiji, those that support our iconic events, our fundraising campaigns, the Bushels, Fiji's Biggest Morning Tea, the Pinktober and Movember. So that's where the financial support comes in that mm. enables us to provide the services for the patients, but mm. as well as whatever the needs are for the um, doc the clinicians, but as well as our outreach programs as well. So allows us to go out and do the awareness out in the communities as well as the corporates. Mm -hmm. um, global cancer advocates say that I mean the vast majority of them believe that governments should do something about cancer. Um, approximately a third of people that were in this survey indicated that they believe the most important governmental measure is to make cancer services more affordable. World Cancer Day 2020 took place as news surrounding the um, emerging COVID-19 
pandemic began to grow. And because of that, we've seen all around the world, governments are now diverting their resources, their attention, uh, and, and, and even the media attention is going towards, towards that global mm -hmm. pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and this question is to both of you. Um, you, Dr. De La Salle, from a mm -hmm. perspective of a healthcare provider, and, and you, ma'am. Um, so are you getting enough support from the government? And, and in what areas do you think that that support and that capacity could increase? I, I, I'd start off with, uh, since the COVID uh, situation, we have only done cancers mm -hmm. and emergency surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. So because of preparation for in case we had the COVID uh, and uh, obviously the government have done a, uh, a fantastic job in controlling COVID in our country. And, uh, but um, you know, cancer doesn't stop with COVID. Mm -hmm. Cancer keeps, keeps coming and emergency keeps coming. And uh, we doing the best we can to try and uh, get all the cancer, uh, obviously um, being aware, all these awareness programs been running. More people are, are coming more forward there, uh, but it's still sad to see a lot of cancers, uh, a lot of patients presenting so late. Mm -hmm. And where that's where, uh, as a surgeon, I've been uh, uh, referring more cases to uh, Mrs. Chen mm -hmm. because I can't do much as a surgeon to, you know, they are at their late stage yeah, and they are supported by them. And that's, uh, you know, again, I, I commend Fiji Cancer Society. The work they do is really tremendous, eh? uh, and I'm sure you know our our government uh, are aware of uh, of Fiji Cancer Society. Eh? They're the only uh, non-government um, organisation in Fiji that support uh, people that we deal with, eh? that we operated on, and those that we can't operate on. These guys carry on that uh, supportive palliative role mm -hmm. for them and their families. Uh, they do shopping uh, for them, grocery shopping, medicines uh, for that for that last few stages. Eh? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're doing more cancers. Uh, we're still um, doing a lot of uh, different cancers at the moment, even though we've got the COVID uh, situation still ongoing. Uh, but um, I'm sure we could do more. Ms. Chen, uh, your views on that and also uh as you're answering, I'd also like to ask, what was it like during the first few months of COVID when it hit Fiji? Okay, um, the first few months of COVID. It allowed us to, um, well, it made us re-strategize on, on our plans for the year. So basically, we decided that there was no more outreach programs. One, uh, out of concern for not only our staff, but for the survivors who are our greatest advocates. Um, Two was um, just trying to figure out how how we were going to deliver stuff to the patients because right? we've got the nurse with us. So um, we also decided that we will uh, have a COVID care pack uh, sent out to to the families and explain to them the importance of hand wash, hand sanitizing when they're taking care of their loved ones, uh, equipping them with uh, face masks and gloves while while they're caring for their loved ones. Um, yeah, it it, 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 it it made things a little bit difficult for us at that time because patients would have to contact the nearest health center first and not go to the hospital. So the hospital was basically out of bounds for them for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but it also allowed us to go home to the home and then just have a chat with them to see how they're coping and then try and fill in the gaps there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, for this COVID 19 challenges mm -hmm. and what the government is doing. I think government has done a great um, great work with this COVID-19, yeah. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's kind of like restricted or challenges, actually. We're, we're facing challenges uh, in terms of treatment for patients, um, in uh, delay of uh, drugs coming on time so that they, patients can continue with their chemotherapy. However, we've, we've more or less addressed that, and um, we're hoping that there will be drugs in shortly. But um, in terms of surgery, the services that's available at the hospital, that's all free of charge. So, you know, people need to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they can come over to us to ensure that we provide that humanitarian side of uh, cancer support for them. Ms. Chan, um, thank you very much for joining us thank today you. on the show. <laughs> thank you.
When we come back from our break, we'll speak to a caregiver who'll share his experiences with us. Welcome back. We're joined by uh, Mr. Rupert Bolton, who is a caregiver. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, before this, we are speaking to Mrs. Chan, and she was telling us about the importance of a proper uh, high personal hygiene mm -hmm. and also hand washing and other uh, protocols that need to yes. be followed, especially with COVID-19 when you're caring for someone who is a cancer patient. Mm -hmm. Now, in your personal opinion, how important is it for you to not only look after your own personal health and safety, but also keep in mind the patients? Uh, thanks, Geraldine. I think it's very important, um, s especially since the patient is more susceptible to um, infection. Mm -hmm. So I think personal hygiene is very important for caregivers as well as uh, hygiene of the patient. So uh, generally, yes, that's very important. But it does get quite challenging at times, especially with COVID-19. Uh, you're not able to um, probably go and visit them, say, for example, if you've been in contact with someone who has been recently traveling. And in mm -hmm. instances like that, or say, for example, if your cancer patient happens to be around people who have been uh, exposed to those who might be COVID positive, mm -hmm. what do you do in situations like that? I think it's very important for everyone to be aware and just to maintain that uh, the bubble that they, they talk about mm -hmm. and uh, creating that safe zone for the um, cancer patient. Mm -hmm. um, since we have you here, we'd like to hear about um, some of your personal experiences working with cancer patients, cancer survivors. Um, what does it mean to be a caregiver for a cancer survivor? Okay, uh, from my personal experience, um, I looked after my late grandmother. So it was something, it's sort of a labor of love, I think. Um, anyone <coughs> who has a relative, um, you have that uh, desire to uh, ensure that they have the best uh, care and treatment. So for us, uh, for me personally, it was uh, definitely just um, getting on with the job and ensuring the uh, comfort and um, quality of life, basically. You know, there are so many people um, around the world, especially in Fiji, who are probably watching right now, who know someone um, that is suffering from cancer or is affected by it. Um, what advice would you give them for, for a potential caregiver? Okay. I think um, for caregivers, it's essential that you have that um, desire to ensure that the patient's uh, needs are met and that their quality of life is, is such that they are not left to be um, made to feel like inhumane at the end of their, their journey of uh, the journey of life basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now my grandmother have, uh, unfortunately has passed away two years mm -hmm. ago and she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer stage four. Right. Uh, by the time we found out it was too late to do anything, uh, yes. she just went into palliative care and my mum was uh, a caregiver for her. And knowing exactly what it's like to be in a situation like that where you know where the end of the road is, you know that the, the light of the tunnel is approaching very quickly, mm -hmm. it does become challenging, especially since you're in the role of not just a family member and a loved one, but also as someone who is supposed to be there, not just to meet their physical uh, needs and also the medical needs, but also emotional support. Talk to us about that journey. <coughs> Absolutely. I think that's a very good point that you brought up and um, that's really part of the acceptance and then coming to terms with the, the inevitable. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's, as a family member, I think that's a big role that we can play in a patient's life is just to get that acceptance and get them to a point where they're ready to go, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dr. De La Sao, from a from a medical perspective, you know, we often hear that um, your body will only heal if your mind is, you know, ready to do that healing. So mm -hmm. how important is mental health? And, and I'd also like to um, throw that question uh, after Dr. De La Salle is done to you, Mr. Bolton. Mm -hmm. um, the importance mm -hmm. of mental health and just keeping up a good spirit is when, when, when you find out that you've been you know, mm -hmm. diagnosed mm -hmm. with cancer. Mm -hmm. It's huge. It's, uh, it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, mental health is it's hugely important uh, in... Um, in being diagnosed, yeah, that's a big thing, and also going through surgery and the recovery part. And I think um, it's so important that uh, our friend uh, is here, being a carer. As a surgeon, um, when we look at a patient or with, with a new diagnosis of cancer, it's not just them. Mm -hmm. I think uh, not just in Fiji, but uh, all over the world, it's a whole family 
uh, issue. Eh? It's a family problem, not just a one-person problem. And I think it's really, really important to get that family support. Eh? Some, some patients uh, don't want other family to know about this, which I try and encourage them to get the family involved. Eh? And I always try and get the family meeting where they get all their loved ones in a room when I tell them about a, a new diagnosis. And that's really important to get that uh, mental, uh, mental state, because eh? a lot of times when you get a diagnosis, the only word you remember is cancer, mm. uh, and then nothing else after that. Eh? So I try and just tell them this is something we are worried about. Eh? I'm very concerned about what I can see on you and also on the scans and the investigations so far. I would like your family to come in. Mm. and we can all sit together and it's really important to get that family to come in with you eh? and the whole journey is a very long journey eh? mm. from diagnosis to surgery then to recovery and to further treatment the cancer treatment is a it's a big journey and you really need that um, family support to keep your mental state up as a surgeon I can only do what I can which is to remove that uh, the tumor or that growth. The recovery is on you and the family and your God. Mm -hmm. uh, what I always tell the patients, I'm not, I'm not God. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I believe I've been blessed with my, from God to give this treatment. But your recovery is on you and God and your family. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to build that relationship right earlier on from diagnosis to treatment to recovery. Yeah? And uh, that mental health is hugely important. Yeah, you've got to be strong. Mm. And I, I keep telling the registrars that I work with, you've got to give that ownership back to them. Yeah. Uh, you've got to give them the honest truth that surgery is not just one thing. It's the whole package. Mm. You do, we do what we can, but they have to do. And again, going back to early diagnosis, uh, you, you've got to come early. Because I can't do anything as a human being. I can't cure you when you've got stage 4 cancer. So unlike something like an NCD, which is diabetes, this yes. is something that can be looked after. If, you've, if, you, if it's presented early, you cut it out with treatment, with it's care, you're able absolutely. to get rid of it. Mm. Absolutely. And it's really important for the family to get that as well, eh? that this is a curable thing. And there's a lot of times in Fiji in particular, when you tell the patients their diagnosis, they say, I want to go speak to my children. Mm -hmm. uh, as ladies in particular, I want to go speak to my husband about their breast cancer, which is vitally important, eh? and I totally support that. But again, it's really important to have that um, ownership. This is your body. Mm -hmm. eh? mm -hmm. As a woman, this is your body, and it's your breast. Um, you have to make the decision yourself, but with the support of your family. It's really important for, for husbands and children to put their loved ones first, not them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lot of times you, they go home and they come back and they've changed their mind. Because I think that I believe it's a lot of other people talking to them. Mm -hmm. And it's that bad negative uh, feeding from traditional healers, other, other patients who've had experiences which are not the same as them. It's really important to have that ownership of your own health. Mm -hmm. Make a decision yourself with the support of your loved ones is really key. Mm -hmm. We'll carry on the discussion when we come back in our final segment. Stay with us. Welcome back. So this is our final segment. We'd like to pick up uh, where we left off uh, in the previous one, talking about how it's important to have a support network and also to talk, not just about, um, you know, aftercare, mm -hmm. but also when a diagnosis is made. Now, um, Mr. Bolton, you had told us about how you were a carer for your grandmother. Now, in an instance like that, usually what happens in a familial or a community setting, once you find out that someone has been diagnosed with cancer, the first thing that a lot of people do is they distance themselves from the patient and then if there's a carer that is assigned to the patient, they also start distancing themselves from the patient and the family net network, saying that, well, mm -hmm. they're sick, they've got someone to look after them, I don't need to call them or support them or see them. Mm -hmm. Do you see this happening? Um, I think that's a very interesting point that you raise, and indeed um, families need to be a bit more 
aware that if, despite having a caregiver present, the caregiver also needs a break. And um, it's very important that uh, the families uh, step up and um, provide that extra support, net support network, as you say. And uh, reiterating what the good doctor had mentioned, it's very important for mental health for the caregiver as well as the patient mm -hmm. that the families are more involved and um, give that respite for the caregiver, basically, to have that mm -hmm. time, break time for their, their own mental health. It does get emotionally taxing to be in that Absolutely. particular position, especially if, uh, say, for example, you have a, a, a cancer patient who mm -hmm. decides to give up halfway mm -hmm. uh, through their treatment and decide, mm -hmm. you know what, it's not working out for me, I'm not seeing any progress, and I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yes, that's true, um, but I also think we have to respect to the patient's decision, too. Mm -hmm. so, so in our case, that was exactly what had happened. And um, at, at that time, she had felt that um, she had lived her life and she'd had a good life. Mm -hmm. So despite uh, us wanting her to continue, we had to respect her desire to, to finish off where she wanted to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and on that note, um, to you, Dr. De La Salle, not everyone, of course, survives surgery from cancer. Not everyone recovers from cancer. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about the possible reasons why or the complicating factors that may cause death uh, when, um, uh, when someone is diagnosed with cancer. Mm. Um, the idea that a lot of people have to go to India to seek mm. medical treatment, mm. is that absolutely necessary? Mm -hmm. And are there services that are not available in Fiji? Mm. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll start off with, um, there's a quite a big question. Yes. <laughs> start off with in terms of surgery, uh, as I can talk from the surgical point of view, as I said, cancer diagnosis is a, is a journey uh, and it's so important to get that family support. When you're diagnosed with, with a cancer, uh, let's just say in an in a early stage cancer, you're, uh, you come in, uh, I see you in my clinic, you've been referred and uh, you're found after investigation, uh, you're found to have a bowel cancer or a colon cancer. Uh, just having the diagnosis, a lot of people feel that that's the end of it, so it's, it's not the end. Mm -hmm. like a diagnosis means it's not the end. Eh? Mm -hmm. it's, it's delightful for a surgeon to, to pick these things up early because I know and my colleagues know that they can do something about it. Yeah? It's sad and it's really disheartening to diagnose you on a late stage mm -hmm. because we, you know, we, what we've been trained to do, we can't do. Mm -hmm. That's where the cancer society comes in. Eh? But then once you've been diagnosed, you go through testing. Yeah, you get seen by the uh, anesthetist, you get seen by nurses, by a heart doctor. They check you out completely that you are fit for surgery. It's really important to understand that surgery is not risk-free. Just like anything in life, this is not 100% risk-free. There's risks with surgery. And risks, one of those risks is death. Yeah, you could die from surgery. And that could be directly related or a complication after surgery. When you go through an operation, uh, a patient of mine, I make sure I do all the best I can to reduce that risk. But I, right from the start, I'm explaining there's risks. You could die from this. There's this, this, and this could happen. But everyone in my team will do the best we can to get you through surgery and come out the other side. Causes of death is preventable. Most of them is preventable, but some do happen despite our best efforts. Yeah? And that could be a clot in the leg that goes to the lung. Could be a heart attack, a major heart attack, or a stroke, major stroke. Yeah? Those are the major ones. But again, everything is done to prevent that. Mm -hmm. yeah? That's associated with surgery. For cancer alone, when you have a cancer, your risk of complication goes up just because the way cancer uh, develops, it changes your blood constituency. So your increased risk of getting blood clots, increased risk of getting heart attack. So the earlier it's picked up, the better the chance. Mm -hmm. And the different stages of cancer, I've talked about it earlier, stage one and stage four. There's a few stages in between, eh, two and three. And that's, it's, um, it's more related to the microscopic staging. Eh? So the there are doctors that specialize in looking at tissue under the microscope and then they break it down into different uh, grades mm -hmm. and then, then they classify it into stages. Once the cancer is spread to the lymphatics, mm -hmm. this only can be picked up by the microscope. 
those are the ones that may need chemo or may need radiotherapy. So those are the ones that sometimes, because we don't have radiation in Fiji, and sometimes we run out of chemo, mm -hmm. some of those need to go to India or Australia or New Zealand mm -hmm. because they can afford it. Eh? Um, but if we have those services here, we can do uh, all those things locally. Uh, and there's something we would really, uh, as surgeons, love to have is a radiotherapy treatment here in Fiji. Mm -hmm. It's a huge um, thing to have and will change how we treat cancers in Fiji. Uh, breast cancer, uh, bowel cancer, uh, all kinds of cancer, mm -hmm. there's a radiotherapy part to it. So in, a, in, in summary, cancers, cancer is treated with surgery, can be cured by surgery. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, those are those two. We don't need them in most cases if we come early. The other two, eh? So surgery is the big thing. I guess I'm a bit biased being a surgeon. The cancer doctors, uh, Dr. Anne, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me saying this, Dr. Anne Veu is an um, oncologist at the hospital, and she looks after the, the medicine side of cancer. Mm -hmm. So patients that I've, we've operated on that needs chemotherapy, we get her involved. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I would like to see is that we try to avoid those, those things, eh? Mm -hmm. But by coming early, this is the biggest thing. Dr. Ndelasa, it would be irresponsible of me to not bring this up. There's also cases where we hear of cancer relapses. Yes. Now, if you could just quickly summarize what that means and what, how important it is for if uh, your cancer relapses mm. for you to go back for further treatment. Yes, sure. A again, um, going back to the earlier the treatment, the, r the lesser chance of relapse. So in, uh, in most relapses, majority of relapses happens because it's already more than stage one. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we are, uh, the aim of surgery is what we call in medical terms, oncological resection. So oncological resection means removing all the cancer with some normal tissue around it. It's complete clearance. When that happens, the risk of recurrence is like zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when, we, when it's not a, a complete resection, the risk is very high. So again, after surgery, most of the time, uh, it's after surgery then we tell the patients, look, your cancer is, is more advanced than we thought. Mm -hmm. The investigations that you have before surgery helps us. Your CT scans or your ultrasound scans, eh? those ones help us to sort of guide us in terms of surgery is the way to go or we can't do this safely. Mm -hmm. When you have surgery, most of the time, it's, it's, uh, it's telling you that this is a curable thing. But then we have a group of patients who come in late that we say, look, this is not curable with surgery, but we can offer you surgery to, for comfort, mm -hmm. uh, to help you live comfortably in the last few months you have. Mm -hmm. And again, I think some patients don't understand that, that they're having surgery, but why am I still have cancer? Or why have I got cancer again? But most of the time, the cancer hasn't been removed. Mm -hmm. Or the cancer is too advanced. We've removed it, but we've left some behind. Uh, that will come back. Yeah? So um, sometimes we do surgery for palliative reasons. Eh? Palliative means it's not complete. Mm -hmm. It's not curable. And after removing that, we know that there's cancer behind. Then we refer you to the, to the oncologist. Those are the, they can give you chemo again to control it. But it's not a cure. Mm. Uh, it's really important to understand that. And again, I would like to encourage Fijian patients to ask questions. Mm. Uh, what I find, uh, we are, I mean, this is part of us, we are too shy. We don't ask questions. Eh? We say yes, but when you go home, they ask you, what, what do you have? What, what part of your body has been removed? I don't know. That's really, really bad to, as a doctor, it's a failure on my part. Mm -hmm not to explain that to patients, uh, but it's really important to ask. Be, be confident to ask, what, what have I had? What's wrong with me? What, what have you done to my body? What medicine am I taking? What is this for? Yeah. Be really confident to ask questions and don't be shy. It's a patient's and family's right to know what they're having. Um, very last question to you, Rupert, um, and, and perhaps Dr. Delasau, if you'd like to um, mm. uh, add on. 
Um, do you have a message for anyone who's probably been diagnosed or they're suffering in silence? Mm -hmm. They're not really sure of who, what to do next um, or, uh, you know, that they don't have a big enough support network. Any, any message for such people? I think it's very important that if you feel that you need you, something's wrong, you need to go to a health uh, physician, I mean to a health clinic or to the hospital and have a check. This better to be safe than sorry would be my Mm -hmm. my message and mm -hmm. um, I think um, also the Cancer Society with the work that they do is excellent and we need to support them and people mm -hmm. need to give generously when they have their fundraisers yes mm -hmm. just a last word for me uh, thank you again for inviting me here really really happy to be able to say this um, and uh, we need to talk about it more uh, we need to talk about our health more around the grog bowl around functions talking about more and don't be shy to tell someone that something is not right. And as a relative, as a friend, be more watchful of changes in your friend. Because mm -hmm. this could be the only sign you have. Mm -hmm. And um, ask someone to see you. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. And also uh, to our earlier guest, the CEO of Fiji Cancer Society, Ms. Mm -hmm. Belinda Chen. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Naka. Naka. And that's all we have for you on the show tonight. Thank you for joining us. Have a good evening.